Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Virtual Z's case study on installation of our Lozen product. I'm James Hoadley, Director of Quality Assurance for Virtual Z. With me today from Virtual Z are Jeannie Glass, our CEO, and Vince Ray, our CTO. Our guest is Jerry Edgington, Senior Solutions and Innovation Consultant for Mainline Information Systems. Hi, Jerry, and welcome. Thanks, James. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's our pleasure. Uh, Jerry, you recently installed our Lozen product. Uh, now, if you don't mind, let's go through the installation step by step. So first off, what, if anything, did you need to do to your system's environment or configuration to prepare for the installation? Well, the biggest one was to create a ZFS both on the installation side or the service side, and then that'll need to be created on the on when you deploy it to the production side as well. So that was just creating the ZFS and the ZFS structure itself, mainly. That was the biggest one before you started. Okay. Uh, what version of ZOS did you install our product on? Uh, ZOS 2.5. 2.5. And uh, which version of Java do you have running on your system? We have Java 8 and Java 17. Okay. I, um, actually, how... we have a, I'm sorry. That's my... I, Misspoke. That's a, we have eleven, not seventeen yet. So I apologize for that. All right. Um, so that's eight and eleven. Got gotcha. you. Right. Sixty-four bit um, version. Sixty-four bit. Thank you. Uh, how much disk space was required, approximately, for the installation? For the initial service side or the installation side, was about two hundred meg of uh, ZFS disk space for the ZFS, okay. and then of course you double that. Depending on how many LPARs you have or how you do your deployment, you have to double that for when you go to that environment as well. Right. Jerry, if I might sneak in a question. Um, sure. So, so your model would be one ZFS per LPAR where you would use Lozen. Have you given any thought to how many LPARs and you know, would you run one big copy or lots of smaller copies? Have you done that well, in your case? Typically, I work. We do it two different ways, and it depends on what we're trying to do with the client. So, mm -hmm. clients have had there some clients install one ZFS per LPAR for a product. I prefer to be efficient, so I like to make one ZFS and share it with all of the LPARs within the Sysplex. So, you know, you treat it as a as a shared binary directory. That's my preferred method because it makes it much easier for when you put in maintenance and you can roll the maintenance through. And but that's my preferred method is one ZFS per Sysplex for a product. Yeah, so. yeah, I think that's a good uh, best practice. I think you'll find when you get going that the only thing we're writing to in that ZFS are the are the log files, the debugging information, that kind of thing. And if you wanted to, you could separate that out into a local per LPAR case and then have a completely read-only environment that's very easy to share. Yeah, I, that's one of the things that I used to typically do with ZFS is, especially the binaries, I move the Etsy either into the global Etsy, you know, make a director for that if it's going to be shared, if the Etsy is going to be shared across all of them, that I don't need to modify, I can make it read-only, or if I put it into the LPAR Etsy, for the configuration, and then I use the var directory for logging. So I do purposely direct those because those are what are some of the Etsy, var, dev, and uh, temp are not shared in a ZFS and a Sysplex. The global can be a global one across all where most people put ZOSMF in. So it depends upon the product, but I've done it multiple ways that way as well. So yes, I agree. I like to be efficient. So less work for me on the next, you know, the next upgrade or whatever. Yeah, so I'll try to keep it simple. A lot of people uh, don't really give a lot of thought to the ongoing maintenance over time. Mm -hmm. So having it so that you can update one thing and all of your systems are magically up to date is a is a great idea. Yeah, and I have actually the way my methodology for installing software and main and upgrades is I would have I have everything staged. And it takes an IPL to one change an IPL to put it on and IPL to take it off. And it's only changing the IPL volume. So I tend to bundle those things together and then do a rolling IPL to push them all the way through the environment. So this would be along those same lines is what I would do in Good. a traditional ZOS environment. Good. 
Yeah, no, glad it fits your methodology. That's uh, that's good to hear. Sorry, James, didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, not at all. Uh, expanding on information is a good thing. So um, when you did the installation, did you need to work with anyone else at your site? For instance, the security admin or your network team? Um, for our site internally, we do everything. So there was some RACF work. We have RACF running, so we had some RACF work. We uh, we have we do the TCP IP work as well. So we reserved the port, and we would add you know dynamically uh, add that to the TCP IP stack, and then update the RACF to allow that starter task to work and the other parameters. Because there are some security work that needs to be done, access to the BPX server, the DPX daemon, and if you're going to write SMF records, you need access to that one as well. Um, and you also need to make sure since your code is the code is running APF authorized, you have to take care of how you copy that ZFS over. If you do it at the Unix level, you're going to lose those control bits. So you have to be careful how you move it or copy it. Yeah, yeah, we're careful that our only um, APF authorized code is really just those two binaries that you'll see in the bin directory. Uh, and you know, you're welcome to you know. EXT adder plus AP for those, and they're they're good wherever you end up with them. Well, the reason I bring that up is I've there are some shops that I have seen where they do a uh, a straight Unix copy, like a CP command. Yeah. When you do that, you lose those control those uh, extended bits, the sticky bit, the APF authorized bit. Those get lost when you use that controls. Yep. So yep. that's why I always make sure I tell people that you need don't use the CF the CP command copy the ZFS, which is why I tend to set up a ZFS, a base ZFS for the product, and then I create a ZFS off of that for each version. And then I use a, a symbolic link to that version that I want people to run with by default. Yeah, and that's a great point. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, some other folks that we've worked with will try to restore the, uh, the, the distribution file on another platform and then move the resulting files to their mainframe. And of course, that's another way that you can end up losing all of the extended attributes you're describing. That's that's why in the documentation, we suggest that you restore on ZOS using the uh, PAX utility because it knows how to preserve those uh, extended mm -hmm. attributes correctly. Yeah, another way I've done it, if you're talking about storing Steve stuff in Artifactory, for example, if you use DFDSS to back up the ZFS and then use the um, ter the terse command to compact it and then store that in Artifactory and bring it down. Because if you just do the DFDSS backup and send it, some of those bits get translated. So it's best to do a DFDS backup and then a terse. So then the bits don't get changed at all. Yep. Because even in binary mode, the, byte, the bits can change. So. Yep. Just another something me other method that I've used to promote this and you know deploy it to other Sysplex environments as well. Yeah, no, that's that's good advice, and I think a lot of customers will benefit from that. It sounds like you have the scars of having done this many times, so it's good good experience. I've IPL'd ZOS quite a few times, yes, <laughs> <laughs> so. and also ZVM yeah. and Linux on Z. So yeah, I have quite a bit of experience in those yes. areas. Yes. Actually, that segues next well, nicely into our next question, which is uh, the best way to automate the startup of Lozen. So uh, have you thought about uh, making that a uh, automated startup when you IPL or are you keeping that a manual operation? Um, we Typically, once I get it stabilized, I'll, we'll put it into some sort of automation, either command or ops mm -hmm. MBS or, you know, whatever the whatever the automation tool that the client's using. So once it's stabilized, we have it running, we have it where we want it to be, the configuration's done, then we'll deploy it out and put it into the automation for the starter task. Sounds like you're comfortable with Unix services. So are you thinking it'll stay a Unix kind of a script approach to starting, or are you thinking you're gonna convert that to JCL or in a started task somewhere? Or you know, what are you thinking today? Typically, I, I make them a started task with JCL to call the BPX or the Unix inside. The one reason for that is it's for people who are don't know Unix very well. 
or system programmers, they more, feel more comfortable with JCL and starter tasks. So if you have it as a starter task with JCL, they tend to look at it a lot differently than if you just put it through a batch process or a start a task under US or a start command under USS. So I tend to put it into a batch JCL and then issue the start command from there. Good. Good. It's just it's just simpler for the for somebody to follow up behind you. So because it shows where everything starts from. Yeah, and if you have a automation tool like Ops MVS, then it's probably pretty comfortable with JCL and start a task probably more so than Unix scripts and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I've done that with the GitLab, see the GitLab runners and everything else too. So it it works pretty well. Um it just takes a little bit of effort to get into that format. Um some of TCP IP doesn't allow you to do that, especially with people I've seen people use both ways. But I tend to put things in USS as they are in Linux world and then I Depend upon the environment, I will start them as a starter task with JCL. Typically, that's the best way to do it because automation is built for that, most likely. Yeah, yeah best of both worlds, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, what's your overall assessment of ease of installation for Lozen? For ease of installation, it's very simple. Um, this could be something that a you know beginner could do uh, with controls. So I, I would feel comfortable giving this to like a junior sysprog or even somebody, you know, like the talked about earlier, a person just out of college, as long as they understand Linux, it's pretty straightforward for them. So yeah. Excellent. Good to the hear. The only difficult part would be, would be is communicating and coordinating the other components like the security and the IP stack changes. But, you know, I mean, from a, from a ZOS system programmer installation, yeah, it's very straightforward. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to tell us about uh, Lozen from the user's perspective at this time? Just one point is I would separate, if you're, when I install it, I would separate out, like we talked about before, the Etsy or the configuration from the, from the logs. Most shops don't like to have uh, output being written to the, the default ZFSs, the user LPP directories or, or the op directories. Um, just try to keep in as best practices with Linux environments as well. Because the next person comes behind you, if they have a Linux experience, it makes it easier for them. Makes because sense. It, yeah, if you keep it as a Linux, you know, looking like a Linux environment, it makes it much easier for somebody to come in behind you. And somebody that's SSHing into that knows where they can find things as well. It's much easier that way. That's true. All right. Uh, I think that's all the questions we had for you today on Lowe's and Jerry. We appreciate your feedback and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me.